Good morning. Welcome to Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is John Pater, and I will be your service leader this morning. Joining me on the stage will be Brian Kiley, our minister, who's put together some thoughts and words for this morning's service. As Unitarian Universalists, we are bound together not by a common set of beliefs, but by our promise to support one another in our individual searches for truth and meaning, guided by our principles and drawing from many sources. We do feel you uh, are, feel welcome here. Whatever you believe or don't believe, whatever you love, however you understand family, whatever your age, race, or ability, you are welcome here. We invite you to join us in a journey of free thought, spiritual questing, and justice making for as long as you feel comfortable doing so. We extend a special welcome to our visitors this morning. Please join us after the service for coffee and conversation. We begin our gathering acknowledging that we are located on Treaty 6 territory. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Our community extends beyond the Sunday morning gathering. Please read the announcements in the order of service. We also have a monthly newsletter available in print and online. And you can join our virtual community on Facebook and Twitter to keep up to date on happenings in our extended community. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us let go, just for a time, of the everyday world. And we'll create a space in this hour to simply be together. In the spirit of life and love we gather. The theme for the services for this month of January has been First Nations Spirituality. And in that quest, we've looked at the seven sacred teachings of First Nations Spirituality, which include respect, love, honesty, courage, humility, wisdom, and truth. This morning, we'll focus on two of those, honesty and courage. If you'll now look at your order of service, we have a shared reading that I'll ask you to join me in. And we'll just read these words together. We come with thanksgiving for our very breath, the warmth of sun and the sustaining waters, for life all around us, the plants, soft grasses, and sheltering trees, for the ones that crawl, those that swim, and those that fly, for the four-legged and the two-legged, all our relations. We celebrate the diversity in creation as reflected in the four winds from the four directions. We especially honor the many peoples with their many gifts for understanding our shared life on the earth. We strive to live out the seven sacred teachings, respect, love, honesty, courage, humility, wisdom, truth. These teachings enable us to live in harmony with ourselves, with our neighbors, and all the created earth. I have a story this morning that comes from the West Coast Native tradition, Coast Salish people. I was given permission to tell this story many, many years ago. So it's about Raven. Raven's the great trickster character interaction she has with a frog. Raven was very thirsty. Not just a little dry, but desperately thirsty. For weeks, the lands around her had been growing brown. The rivers had dried up almost completely. The creeks were gone, marked only by rocks where they used to run. The grass was dying. The trees were dying. If they didn't get water soon, All life would disappear. So Raven decided the only thing she could do would be to go off in search of water. But she was so thirsty that she went and she picked up a rock in her beak and put it in her mouth just to make saliva happen, and that gave her a tiny bit of relief. So she flew up high into the air and flew eastwards towards the Rocky Mountains and even over the mountains. She flew and she flew for days with nothing but the rock to comfort her. Until finally, towards evening one day, she looked down and she saw some shimmering lights. 
Well, ravens love shiny things. So she went down to investigate, and as she drew nearer, she realized two things. First, that the lights were actually little pools of water, and that she had discovered the last green valley on earth. The trees were still green. The grasses were blowing gently in the breeze. There were butterflies. There were hummingbirds. It was life as it was supposed to be. And in the middle of this valley was something so big that at first she didn't even notice it. It was a frog. The frog was enormous, almost as big as the valley. And as she landed by the pools of the water, she realized she was facing the frog not more than 10 or 20 meters away. The water pools had fallen from the frog's mouth. She realized the frog had drunk up all the water of the earth. And the frog was sleeping. So the raven hopped up to one of the pools and started to drink cool, refreshing water. It revived her immediately. But just then the frog opened its eyes. That's my water. And his tongue came flipping out, unrolling, trying to attack the raven who jumped out of the way. She went over to another one of the pools and he said, that's my water. And the tongue came again and again it missed. Now finally she was refreshed, but she realized she had to get the water out of the frog and back into the land where it began, where it belonged. But how to do that? Well, that was the trick. See, she was very good at playing tricks on people, and she could easily get the water out of the frog out of the frog with some kind of trick. But if that's how she did it, the frog would just drink it all up again. She had to figure out a way to make the frog want to give back the water. So she thought for a little while, and then she came up with an idea. She hopped up to one of the pools again. Sure enough, the frog snaked out its tongue, and instead of drinking she dropped the rock on the frog's tongue and the frog swept it back up into its mouth. And then the raven sat safely back and waited for a while. And after a time, the frog said, Oh, oh my. What's the matter? said raven. My stomach hurts. Well, I'm not surprised, you greedy devil. You've got all the water in you in the world, and I bet when you've been attacking me, you went and, I don't know, swallowed a rock or something, and now the rock's making you sick. you got to get it out of there. Please get the rock out. Well, I, what am I supposed to do? If I come close to you, you're just going to attack me. No, no, I won't attack you. It hurts so much, I promise. And you can drink all the water you want. Well, what about the rest of the world? It's my water. Well, then why should I help you? And she waited. And the frog said, Okay, please help me. So she went up and said, I'm going to have to poke around a little bit to try and find where the rock is. So she hit him as hard as she could in the belly. And a great gout of water burst out of his mouth and flowed away and formed a river. She did it two or three more times and the river widened. And and you could see as it flowed downstream that flowers were starting to lift their heads and the grass was greening just a little bit. She knew she was on the right track. And finally she said, I think I found the rock. I can get it out, but it might hurt a little bit. Please, because all that punching didn't help any. Please get it out. So she hopped up to him with her very sharp beak. She poked a hole in the frog's belly. And the water started to gush out and it flowed in every direction, making huge pools and bringing life back to the earth. And in time, the rock flowed out. Meanwhile, the frog went from huge, it shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk until it was the size of, well, a frog. And it crawled up on the rock. And it sat there going, oh, it feels so much better to be in the water than to have the water in me. Yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's why you shouldn't be greedy and try and take everything for yourself, Mr. Nestle. (laughs) That's why you have to leave the water to the rest of us, to the trees and the fish and the animals and the grasses and the insects who need it to live. Sorry, said the frog. Sorry. 
I won't do it again. And the raven gathered up the water like a big cloak and flew it back out over the mountains, dropping water as she went. And everywhere it went, the world began to turn green again. And life returned. And to this day, if you go out on a spring evening, you can hear the frogs remembering their great sin and croaking out, sorry, sorry, (laughs) sorry. And if perchance a raven happens to be flying over, they might just send down a little reminder. Rock! 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 And that's how Raven returned the water. So our sermon part is going to be broken up into two parts. One on courage and one on honesty. The first part is courage. And I'm going to start this out with a little reading put together by Dave Corshane Jr. and Cindy Crow on courage, bravery as represented by the bear. Courage as per dictionary definition, mental or moral strength to venture, persevere, and withstand any difficulty or danger, fear, or hardship. Implies firmness of mind and will in the face of danger or an extreme danger. Originates from the French and Latin root forms of cour, from the heart. To have courage is to have the mental and moral strength to listen to the heart. It takes courage to do what is morally right. Indigenous peoples were told to be proud of who we are and never to deny the way of life the Great Spirit gave to us. Courage is facing our daily problems and challenges with strength of character. It is standing up to protect our values and being truthful in the face of ignorance. Courage is what enables each person to seek out the greater good for a higher purpose. To have bravery and to overcome fears that prevent us from being our true spirit as human beings is a great challenge to all of us, yet we must all find the courage to overcome this challenge. The bear provides many lessons in the way it lives, yet courage is the most important teaching it offers. Though gentle by nature, The ferociousness of a mother bear when one of her cubs is approached is the true definition of courage. The bear represents living of the heart, living your spirit. The bear is very close to the land and it has brought many medicines to the people. Teachers, protectors, healers are all examples of living the bear totem. When we have a hard time in our life, whether it be something we're going through or a decision that we have to make in our lives, and we are afraid, We call on the spirit of the bear to help us have the courage and strength to do the right thing in our lives. Find the courage and maintain the bravery to listen to the younger and older generations. Find the courage and maintain the bravery to help the ones that need your help. Find the courage and maintain the bravery to be the active bystander. Find the courage and maintain the bravery to help yourself and to help others that may not require your assistance. Find the courage and maintain the bravery to become an all-around good and healthy person for the betterment of all of society as a whole. I've got a couple of preliminary remarks today. The first is about the use of language and story. Last week I used several terms to describe First Nations and Métis people. And this is a tricky area, especially because I'm not part of any of those communities. I am aware that the terms are highly sensitive and that while there are some generally accepted phrases, there is no complete agreement about any of them. People get to name themselves as they wish. That's fantastic. But even groups of people who get to name themselves don't always agree on what they wish to be called. I was struck yesterday reading the paper when I was reading about the trial in Saskatchewan that's just starting where a Caucasian man is on trial for second-degree murder for shooting a young First Nations man who had trespassed on his property. It's a very tense situation. But the reporter, who was himself First Nations reporter, said this could be very upsetting to the Indian community, which is a word that I've been taught I'm not supposed to use anymore. It's very confusing. So that's what makes it tricky for an outsider like me. In my word choices, I mean no disrespect. I do sincerely apologize if any of the words I choose 
or seem to be appropriate. I'm stumbling along trying to learn this path of reconciliation as best I can. And secondly, there is controversy about the use of traditional stories and music. Cultural misappropriation, it is called. Now, long ago, I received permission from a West Coast elder to tell the story I told today, as well as several others. We were in a storytelling class together. I am grateful for that permission. It is a blessing. As for music in some of the services we're doing over these two months, I've been told that it is all right to use indigenous music as long as it is in context and not for profit. And yes, all the recorded music was properly purchased. And one final thought. In referring to the seven sacred teachings, I'm naming the animals used by indigenous groups as symbols. But of course, they're not universal. Different animals flourish in different parts of this vast land of ours. And as was pointed out to me by another Eastern-born person like myself last week, in our discussion on respect, she noted that there are no buffalo in Ontario and Quebec. So far, I have not been able to find corresponding creatures among the nations to the east, but we're both working on it. It would be wrong to see anything in these services as absolutely definitive. There are many nations among our indigenous cultures. And while they all have great similarities, for example, use of the medicine wheel, there are also great differences in interpretations, definitions, and usage. Why shouldn't there be all of those differences? Why shouldn't there be... None of us do things exactly the same way. Why should any other culture be expected to either? So what I'm hoping to do in very broad strokes is to tease out some of the lessons that indigenous culture has to offer the dominant majority. As I said last week, we've talked too long and listened too little. And if the truth and reconciliation process has taught us anything, it's time for the majority to listen and learn. Now, one of the two themes today is courage. And my little preamble is a part of that. Dealing with sensitive subjects up here in the pulpit sometimes feels just a little bit risky. There are some weeks when I'm more nervous than others. I haven't been terribly brave in mounting these services because I think I have a pretty good, long-standing relationship with most of you in this community. I know there's a good likelihood that I'm going to annoy some of you because of my words or ideas, but mostly you're pretty kind to me when I take a risk. Most of you know my intentions and my character, so I feel fairly safe, but maybe, maybe I've been just a little bit brave taking on these spiritual teachings. But addressing our relations between dominant and First Nations culture is something we must do. We must do it if we are to consider ourselves the principled people we aspire to be. And as minister of this congregation, I cannot in good conscience ignore this huge and complex set of issues. We say we affirm a set of values that include respect for all beings and a commitment to justice, equity, and compassion. If we cannot face the injustice and inequity that are foisted and oppression that are done to some of the people in this land, then we aren't very good at living into our values. And I think facing those things goes a little bit beyond having a blanket exercise as we did two weeks ago and having a First Nations elder speak to us two weeks from now. Those are really good things to do, to hear voices and gather experiences from the people who are most affected. But at some point, we also have to have the courage to talk amongst ourselves, to confront our own failings, and contemplate how we can better live as Treaty 6 people. Now, this series is but a small example of courage. No one's risking life on a battlefield or running into a burning building to save a child. No one is putting their job on a line or standing up for something that might garner a violent response. But that's okay. Rather, we are asking one another to think about our own role with respect to indigenous issues, to revisit our ideas and maybe discover that some of the beliefs we held or even still hold are prejudiced 
and racist. Last week, I told you about the Canadian history I learned as a boy and young man in university. Indigenous people were painted as cultureless cardboard cutouts meant to be saved, people who were convenient allies when the French and the British needed them, and hindrances when the governments of the day were done with them. Over the years, I've had to learn that the lessons I was taught, that my understanding about this country and its origins and its history were wrong. There were big, big holes in the truth I was taught. And I also had to come to terms with the racism I was taught and surely had absorbed at least to some degree and that shaped my values. I like to think that I've learned, but I won't claim that I'm done learning. Have you ever had that sick, sick feeling in the pit of your stomach when you realize that some belief you had was fundamentally wrong? Some people shut that down and simply shout out their beliefs more loudly, afraid to take the risk to explore their own views. They're terrified of being wrong, so they insist they're right. I bet I don't have to offer very many examples of that phenomenon to you folks. We see it all over the political spectrum these days. It takes small, quiet courage to confront ourselves and our values to really examine our conscience and to see if what we think and do is in line with honorable values. The reading we heard from John is about this kind of smaller, everyday courage. It's courage born out of self-respect. From the reading, indigenous people were told to be proud of who we are and never deny the way of life the Great Spirit gave to us. Be brave enough to claim who you are. It continues, Courage is facing our daily problems and challenges with strength and character. It is standing up to protect values and being truthful in the face of ignorance. That takes bravery. This small courage, this personal courage, is the core of this spiritual teaching. It's not about heroics. It's about living bravely in small ways every day. Quote, when we have a hard time in our life, whether it be something we are going through or a decision that we have to make in our lives and we are afraid, we call on the spirit of the bear to help us have the courage and strength to do the right thing in our lives. Find your courage. Maintain the bravery to listen to the younger and the older generations. What a concept. Find the bravery to listen to younger and older generations for their insights and their wisdom. Find the courage to maintain the bravery to help the ones that need your help. Sometimes we have to step out of our safe space to help someone who really needs it. Find the courage and maintain the bravery to be an active bystander. I love that phrase. The active bystander. That when you're in a conversation somewhere and someone says something that's racist or inappropriate, to call it out. That takes bravery. Find the courage to maintain the bravery to help yourself and help others that may require your assistance. Simple, everyday acts that require true courage. This reading by Marnie Harmony, a Unitarian Universalist minister. If on a starlit night with the moon brightly shimmering, we stay inside and do not venture out, the evening universe remains a part of life we shall not know. If on a cloudy day with grayness infusing all and rain dancing rivers in the grass, we stay inside and do not venture out, the stormy threatening energy of the universe remains a part of life we shall not know. If on a frosty morning, dreading the chilling air before the sunrise, we stay inside and do not venture out, the awesome, cold, quiet, and stillness of the dawn universe remains a part of life we shall not know. If throughout these grace-given days of ours, surrounded as we are by green life and brown death, 
hot pink joy and cold gray pain and miracles, always miracles. If we stay inside ourselves and do not venture out, then the fullness of the universe shall be unknown to us and our locked hearts will never feel the rush of worship. So we're going to now shift our focus to the topic of honesty. Honesty, again, this is some words from Dave Crochane Jr. and Cindy Crow, and they say honesty is represented by the Sasquatch. The Sasquatch. The dictionary definition, they say, not willing to cheat or defraud, not deceptive or fraudulent. Honesty means worthy of being depended on, marked by truth, facts, real and or genuine without pretensions and or false accusations. Dave Crushane says, Keep your life simple and speak the truth. Choose honesty and kindness as your guides, and happiness will follow you. They go on to say, People who are honest are trustworthy. Being honest makes your life simple and pure. To be honest with yourself is to live in the spirit of how you were created. Never lie or gossip about each other. The more honest you are, the bigger you become as a person. The basic part of honesty is innocence, free from evil influence or effect. Honesty meant that being an honorable, respectful person is free from fraud or deceptions. Honesty meant a refusal to lie, steal, or deceive in any way. The highest honor that one could bestow upon an individual was the saying, there walks an honest person. They can be trusted. Honesty to the elders meant being true to yourself. Elders would say, never try to be someone else. Live true to your spirit. Be honest to yourself. Accept who you are and the way the Creator made you. The Sasquatch, which represents this law and teaching symbolically, reflects the understanding of honesty. The elders say that when you are honest and have nothing to hide or be ashamed of, your spirit is the size of the Sasquatch. When you lie or do something bad and hide it from the people, it affects your spirit, not allowing it to grow strong. It does not feel good when you know you have done wrong and hidden it. When one does this, it eats away at your spirits, suppressing it and not allowing it to grow strong. So in order to have a strong spirit, we must be honest to ourselves and to others. To be truly honest was to keep the promises one made to the Creator, to others, and to oneself. In part, this series on sacred teachings is inspired by a similar set of services done by my colleagues at the Southminster Steinauer United Church last year. And in their order of service on honesty, they included some non-Indigenous quotes, but they nicely raised a couple of points I would like to discuss. The first is by an American minister, James Faust, who says, Honesty is more than not lying. It is truth-telling, truth-speaking, truth living and truth loving. In truth, I found some of the ideas included in the reading John shared to be wonderfully idealistic and a little bit impractical. For example, I'm not sure I can agree that being honest makes your life simple and pure. Sometimes honesty seems to make things really, really complicated. A good many people offer falsehoods in order to spare the feelings of others, in order to stay uninvolved in messy situations that do not really concern them, or to avoid a commitment that they do not wish to make. Oh, I'm just heading out the door to a salesperson who is calling. Or, oh no, your sister didn't say anything to me when we wish to avoid being pulled into a problematic family triangle. The author Pamela Meyer comments, white lies keep social dignity intact, and they're far more prevalent than most people realize. Several studies have found that an average person is lied to from 10 to 200 times a day, mostly to keep a conversation going, to avoid conflict, or to establish a connection with someone, or to be an answer in question period. By contrast, clergyman James Faust, who wrote that first quote, notes, when we tell little white lies, we become progressively colorblind. It's better to remain silent than to mislead. 
Now, his warning is a wise one, I think, but Ms. Meyer's comment raises a different question. Is it better to be scrupulously honest in everything, or should we look to a larger truth that might be involved? To phrase it another way, is it, it, is it honorable to be brutally honest in all things when that can mean we're being very, very hurtful? Or do we owe one another some compassion and some caring? Is the whole unvarnished and sometimes hurtful honesty the definition of trustworthy? Well, sometimes that is exactly what is required, and that takes courage as well as honesty. But I wonder if we're being any less trustworthy when we first work to find gentler ways to communicate our truth, ways that may be more effectively heard and not so subject to angry dismissal. Though each of you may have a strong reaction to these ideas I'm presenting, I doubt that there's a single right answer that will satisfy all of us. I'm afraid that I have never been a fully black and white person. Sometimes the answer is to be courageous and stand up for the absolute truth. But I suspect successful interactions can also be found in the grayer areas as well. Second quote is from Thomas Jefferson. Honesty is the first chapter in the book of wisdom. Honesty is the first chapter in the book of wisdom. Sounds great. Honesty is, the, yeah, I can live it. Honesty is the first chapter in the book of wisdom. But I wonder if he meant that obvious reading of it. I don't think he was speaking about little white lies here. So what could he have meant? Well, at first blush, it seems to be, say, he seems to be saying that by being honest, we become wise. But I don't think that's it. Our own Ralph Waldo Emerson once proposed that wisdom was experience passed through the fire of thought. That we had to live a little and think about it, and that's how we become wise. And I suspect that Jefferson discovered that pure honesty had many consequences, some satisfying and others rather troubling. And similarly, being caught in a falsehood also had those same multiple consequences. Another aphorism is that truth hurts. Sometimes it hurts the teller as much as the hearer. Speak with that kind of unvarnished honesty a few times and you may discover that you're, well, losing friends or that you spoke with incorrect information. We say what we say based on the knowledge that we have at the time. Now that knowledge may be set on what we think are facts, but it may also be based on rumor or hearsay. It could be standing on a misunderstanding or a lack of knowledge about the full context of a conversation. I used to think certain things about our indigenous peoples based on what I was taught in school, but I had far less knowledge of the facts and especially of the context than I thought I had. And the things I honestly said and believed turned out to be wrong. It's the experience of the consequences of honesty favorable and unfavorable that lead to wisdom. Life passed through the fire of thought. We learn from the experiences we've had along the way. We learn when we were in error and that our words have been terribly truthful and terribly hurtful. Understanding this, well, sometimes we may end up choosing the compassionate path and sometimes we will choose the hard truth. It takes wisdom to know which is appropriate. It depends. Sometimes I think those are the two wisest words in the English language. It depends. The older I get, the more I prefer wisdom to knowledge. Honesty is a wonderful quality, but knowing now, knowing how to speak both honestly and gently, and knowing when to simply maintain silence as James Faust advocates, are both good qualities to cultivate. From our reading, honesty to the elders meant being true to yourself. Being true to yourself. 
elders would say, never try to be someone else. Live true to your spirit. Be honest to yourself. Accept who you are and how the Creator made you. Have you noticed, in those of you who were here last week, that on all four teachings we've looked at, this idea of starting with the self is the beginning place of all these spiritual teachings. First, you have to get yourself right. So maybe the real challenge of honesty is to be honest with ourselves first and then maybe, just maybe, we can live more honestly in our relationships with others around us. Amen. Service is ended. The chalice is extinguished. But its light lives on in the minds and the hearts and the souls of each one of you. So carry it with you when you leave this place. Let it be the center for you, the thing that allows you to radiate outward and share the love with those you know, with those you meet, with those you have yet to meet.